Hello. Um, thank you very much for joining me for this latest episode of Soundtrack and Extra on YouTube. Um, my little companion uh, visual show to my podcast. Um, on this week's podcast, we've got Ben Frost, who's done many things. Um, most recently, the fantastic score for Dark. That is this brilliant... It's very hard to explain. Just go and look it up on Netflix. It's great. Uh, so you can hear Ben on the podcast this week, along with a lady you're about to hopefully sit and watch. She's called Rada Blank. And I love this woman. I think she's extraordinary. And she has a film also on Netflix called 40 Year Old Version, which she wrote, she directed, and she stars in. It's the first thing she's kind of ever properly directed. She's been a theatre uh, writer and well the, the film is kind of very close to her real life as you'll hear her explain. It's up on Netflix now and I just think she's such a brilliant voice and brilliant energy, brilliant company and it's a real treat to get the chance to enthuse and introduce to some of you. I know some of you will already know Rada and her brilliant work. Um, I was coming completely new to her through this film and now I'm slightly obsessed with her. And it was such a treat to get to chat to her. So I thought for this episode, I just really wanted to focus on her and focus on how great she is. And hopefully you're going to sit down and enjoy our kind of 20 minute chat, which has got a little few, a few edits and stuff in it. But hopefully you enjoy the conversation. So here, ladies and gentlemen, I present to you the fabulous Rada Blank. First up, here's a trailer for the film. Any more thought on what kind of play we want to write? Remember, if you put in nothing, it'll be nothing. Like your career? Remember this face? She was one of Spotlight Magazine's 30 under 30 playwrights to watch. We watched, but where'd she go? How are you? Good. Archie tells me you're teaching. How's somebody who ain't had no real hit gonna tell me how to write a play? She ain't no Tyler Perry. I did win a 30 under 30 award. Yes, it was quite a couple of years ago. What do I gotta do? Write a slave musical, an all white play? This some bullshit. It rang a little inauthentic. I asked myself, did a black person really write this? This some fucking bullshit, bullshit. Think about me doing hip hop. Doing what to it? I want to make a mixtape about the 40-year-old woman's point of view. Why my skin so dry? Why am I yawning right now? Why them AARP niggas sending shit to my house? This is 40. Hey, Omar, what you need? <clears throat> Beats, tracks. For what? For me. Yo, here's a little story about a girl who's black. Let's add some asthma attacks from all the courtyard crack. Yo, no happy blacks in the plot lines, please. But a crane shot a big mama crying on her knees. Yo, yo, it's Rada Miss Prime, 40 year old version. Go, Rada. Yo, yo, yo. <laughs> this is about creating something that is mine. You're not just talking about shit, you're making shit. Shit. I got you. You don't think I'm some crazy old girl for doing this? I ain't say all that. 40 year old version. White man with a black woman's butt. How you carry all that back there? What the fuck? Yes, what the fuck? This film that you've made is absolutely brilliant. Oh, I... Thank you so much. I had all the emotions watching this film, actually. Like, I think everything. That always surprises me because um, as a person who was a stand-up comic for a couple of years, I realized for me, and it's what I love about, say, Christopher Guest's work, for me, the, the, the key is to not try to do anything, like to not try to make anybody feel anything, to not try to make anybody laugh. Um, and so I really was just trying to tell my story or, or just an honest and authentic New York story. And so I'm always kind of moved when people say, oh, my God, I laughed my ass off or, oh, my God, I was moved. I cried or whatever. And so that it's always nice to hear that because I wasn't expecting that response. You know, when did you when did you know that you wanted to 
to tell this story, your story, in the way that you have, what was the catalyst to go and I'm going to do this, I'm going to I'm going to write this, and this is how I'm going to make it? Yeah, um, I think like a lot of art in the world, it, it came out of frustration. Um, I'd gotten fired. This off podcast the... exactly the same. Okay, <laughs> exactly, and uh, frustration as an engine. It could be a book. Um, and I have many tales based on that. But um, yeah, it was some adversity. I got fired off of a, my first screenwriting job, which was a big deal because um, not only does it mean like getting credit and getting paid, but like I got into the union off of this job. I was adapting a book that I had loved and I submitted the first draft. They loved it. Second draft, they loved it. Third draft, not so much. And um, I, as an artist and a person who'd been working in theater and just different uh, 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 parts of writing had, had kind of used that muscle in different ways. I just was frustrated that it all came down to me getting kind of ousted from a job when I'd invested all of this time. And so I just decided like the next thing I do, I won't, I can't get fired from. Mm -hmm. And so <laughs> I decided to write, direct, star, produce. And initially that was a web series. Yeah. And, um, the idea was just to shoot 10 episodes. And at the same time, I was kind of crafting a mixtape that you could download once you finish the series. Um, but two weeks before I went to shoot the series, my mom passed away and we were best friends. She was the Sophia to my Dorothy and um, had the same birthday. And so it kind of devastated my life. And um, again, more adversity. Um, initially I was gonna leave um, storytelling, art, you know, the industry altogether, because I just was like, what's the point, you know, when my biggest champion and cheerleader is not around, you know? Um, but what I instead did was I took all of the music that I had created as a companion piece to the web series. And I started going out and performing as Rodimus Prime. And it was, it was a catharsis like no other because, um, you know, I had right before my mother passed away, I had just turned 40 and, um, you know, I still had a lot of questions about what it meant to be an adult woman and, and the person who I, I wanted to answer those questions weren't here. So the, the the live show became a way to kind of work through all that frustration around turning 40, but turning 40 without my mom and my body changing, my eyesight changing, but still like in the young, you know, mm -hmm. the young bloods. <laughs> and so I had kind of transformed the mixtape into a live show, a live mixtape. And I performed that for two years um, and then eventually got back, you know, because I even went out, I, I was in the UK, I was in Norway doing it in little little cabarets here and there. Yeah. When I came back and looked at the web series, it just felt too, I guess, small, yeah. you know? And so I just started transforming it into a feature. But um, that's how I ended up with the film is, you know, a web series, then two years as Rodimus Prime and then it was a film, yeah. There's, um, there's, I encourage people, you know, watch the film, but watch the closing credits as well, because there's two brilliant pieces of footage in there, particularly. Yeah. Um, and, and is that a clip from you on tour as Rodimus Prime that's in there as well? That's me performing as so Rodimus good. Prime at Joe's Pub, you know, in, I want to say 2014, 2014. Because I remember the reason that show was such a big deal is because two days later, I moved out to LA <laughs> to start working in TV. And so this was my Rodimus Prime show in New York, my first big show in New York, and also my going away party <laughs> uh, as I moved to the West Coast. Uh, but yeah, that is actual footage from my show. And so in a way, the film becomes like an origin tale, right? Of yeah. how this alter ego uh, came about. And very much like my alter ego in the film, it really did, um, it became, um, I don't know, like a hub of safety, kind of being that character or to taking on Rodimus Prime. It really saved me from like serious depression and grief, you know, and, and, and again, in a way that I'm always surprised and touched when people say, oh, I was laughing, blah, blah, blah. I was doing the show to kind of just, get this demon of grief or the fear around aging out of me. I had no idea that women, especially women of a certain age, that the show would resonate with them. You know, cause I have, I have a song called Poke Chops, which is my fat girl sex anthem. 
And so I had no idea that women would be like, oh my God, thank you for that yeah. song. You've given you know? women the, the you've you've you you've given women the almost the license to laugh at themselves. Do you know what I mean? It's the most that's awesome thing. Yeah. I mean I I mean yes, I know that there's a pandemic in the world, but I don't know that we should take all these other things so seriously. Um, you know, um, Bevy Smith, who is an amazing um, personality in New York, she has her own show, Bevelations. And I don't know how old this woman is. I, I, don't, I have no idea because she is eternally youthful. And she always says, you know, it's greater later. And, um, <laughs> you know, I think about that, you know, the alternative to getting older is being dead. So... <laughs> Anything, anything is better than that. You know, I when you think about it, it's like being dead, being 40, you know what I mean? Like that does have a resonance to it. And so now it's just like, how do we kind of give people permission to celebrate that and not feel like, because the aging is never an issue with the person. It's always everyone else. When they say things like, you're how old? Oh my God, you look yeah. great because... I guess at 40, you're supposed to look run down and, and beat up. Um, but just giving people permission to maybe laugh at themselves so that they can just appreciate what's looking yeah. back at them in the mirror. Yeah. You know, and also to encourage people to like, okay, get you, you feel old, get with somebody young. That'll make you feel young real quick. I mean, there's so much about the film that I love. Just the, just the term robo-pop, I spat my tea out across across the and that was something i think i just in the moment because the actor we found out he was a little bit older than he said he was and so i was like where does this man get this because initially in the scene it's more physical between them um initially archie opens the door and you see them tussling it was like more physical comedy you always have to cut things down but he really was robocop because he was relentless and he was a flirt i think he was like very close to 80. Yeah. That didn't stop him. He so still good. had he still had some blood in his veins. And he wanted to share it with somebody, anybody. And the scene where you're being interviewed is just the timing in that scene and the the script of how he the how rude he is in his introduction. It's just but it's and but and your reactions is it's one of I just think it's a piece of comedy genius oh thank you that kind of how he's completely blasé about what he's what he is coming out of his mouth and the repercussions yeah. of what and he's not at all like that frank delella is a real new york theater you know i wouldn't call him critic he's just an eye on yeah, the yeah. culture and we have the same birthday and he was really sweet to agree to be in the film. He really helps to authenticate the story. You know, I'm, it's a send up of my life. And, and I'd say 70% of the film is, is really me. That's my apartment. That's my brother. That's my father's music, my mom's artwork. And so he really does help authenticate the mock the documentary element, because that was really my inspiration was a lot of these films where people are kind of sending up themselves. Mm -hmm. And so, um, Frank, who is normally a very sweet guy. I mean, to me, it's just that 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 New York exchange. Like we we people consider us ruthless, but really we're just honest. And he was he was he was wondering where I was. Ten years. <laughs> yeah. And then, I, but I think as well that what the film does brilliantly is it really also it addresses really important issues on on race and. Mm -hmm. um, you know and diversity and the opportunities and there's i think that there's one line there's so much within the film but there's one line for me that really just the power of it i think is extraordinary is where um you come outside and you're with your agent and there's like we tried and the working black directors are working and that line for me just kind of it says so much Mm. Of, I mean, what's, you what's know, Edith, industry? yeah, I mean, I honestly don't think I can count. I think I can count all of the um, uh, story decorated Black theater directors, you know, working on that level on one hand. Um, I'm not quite sure 
how that happens um, yeah. when there are so many um, amazing directors and aspiring directors in the business. But on that level, when you're like off Broadway and put very close or maybe on Broadway, what happens, I think, and it's funny because the the film and theater industries are starting to become more and more like each other. You know, it's more risk averse, you know? So if they're gonna do a show on Broadway and I'm sure we're gonna see a lot of this as Broadway comes back from COVID, you know, how do we make sure we pack the house? Let's get a celebrity, yeah. you know? I, even in terms of building the play, like, you know, you want celebrity cameos, but you want a recognizable name in the director. And there's so few black directors who get that opportunity on Broadway. And so what I was saying in the film was not far from the truth. And it's something that I've gone through um, as a younger theater artist, like just wanting to, nothing against any other kind of director, but I do, feel like there's something to working with someone who can challenge you around um, like some of the cultural tropes that may present itself in a play. You know, how is an older white director gonna, gonna do that? And that's why the, the character says, that, what can, you know, Julie tell me about Harlem? She's never even lived there, you know what I mean? So it's like, you know, like just trying to be honest about the frustrations a lot of black um, and, and people of color, playwrights and theater makers are going through right now, yeah. you know? Yeah, I think that there's, that's what's so great about the film is it has all these kind of layers. It has that wonderful entertainment, you know, ability, but then there are lots of, of very important conversations that are being had throughout the, the script and the narrative. I think you've done an extraordinary job. How was Thank it, you. How was it writing, directing, acting and producing? Um, hold on, let me call my therapist and they can um, <laughs> let me get her on speed dial and she'll tell you. Um, it was insane. It was, I remember being on set the very first day. The very, very, very first scene that we shot was that scene where Archie and I are on the bench <clears throat> at the park and I'm yeah. gonna tell him I'm doing the mixtape. That's the very first scene that we shot. And I remember being out there um, the whole crew is kind of standing around and we're about to shoot. And all of a sudden my, so we have like these two butt cheeks, right? Buttocks, and there's a crack in the middle. My butt became so tight that I think I fused them together and there was no crack. Like I was so like, what did you, like I'm smiling, I'm trying to be the leader. And inside the narrative is like, you're fucking crazy. Oh my God, why did you decide to do this? You're gonna be in your own film, you're an idiot. That was my thought as I was saying, action, you know what I mean? Um, but I, for some, somehow, some way I found the fortitude to move forward. I had a great uh, DP in Eric Bronco who was like my second eye. Um, I, to me, the hardest job as a, or the most important job as a director is the cast, hiring your cast. And I work with Jessica Daniels, who is also a native New Yorker. So there was this, like Eric, there was this investment in making this New York film, you know, for, uh, as New York natives. And I just surrounded myself with people who could help me in doing the heavy lifting. And then at times I had to tell one part of myself to sit down, you know, like, we'd be in a scene together and the screenwriter's like, you know, I don't, and I said, oh, no, thank you. No, no, no. You did your job. You won a couple of awards too. So you can just sit your ass down right over there and shut the fuck up because you've done your job. Can the actor and director do? And then, you know, Clark Johnson was one of my advisors at Sundance and he's an actor who's also been in films and TV that he's directed. And he gave me some good advice. He said, do me a favor. When you're in the scene, whatever you do, make sure you remain the actor, not the director, because you'll be in a scene where you deliver a line to an actor, and then when they respond, your face does something like this while you're in the scene. <laughs> and so I had to just, I had to compartmentalize, that's all, you know. Um, I'm, I'm shocked sometimes when I look at the film and I'm still laughing at things, you know. I'm like, oh wow, we did something right. But at some point you're just like, what am I gonna do, tell everybody to go home? So <laughs> I just kept going. I just kept going like I hope this works out and I think it did oh it so does it's so beautiful as well it just looks 
stunning. It really Thank does. You. You got yeah, it. that's Eric Bronco, the DP, Nat Jenks at um, Goldcrest in New York. We did the color correction. And I really was obsessed with the, with the aesthetic um, because people have done New York black and white films before, but this was our version of it. And um, Roy de Carava is a photographer who I studied, a black photographer who shot black life in the 50s and 60s in black and white. Mm -hmm. And in that, in his work, you just see all these beautiful shades of gray. And so I always use people's skin tone from mine to Peter Kim who plays Archie and Oswin to kind of just make sure we were all popping on the screen. And, and just, I wanted people's mouths to water, you know, when looking at the image and so, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And even those, uh, and the, the wonderful kind of textures that you get as well. Like I love that scene where you are kind of riffing in the mirror in your apartment and we're looking at you from behind. So we see the, but we see, and just the kind of all those sort of little kind of um, like smudges and, and. Yeah. And, and that's all, you know, that's my apartment in New York. I live in New beautiful. York in Baltimore. Thank you. It's it's a little room that I've had for like 10 years. So I have lived that New York life. And um, one of the other, two of the other artists who inspired me are Carrie James Marshall, the painter, and Carrie Mae Weems, the photographer. And, you know, Carrie James Marshall, I call him the mirror. Mm -hmm. um, often the black figures in his films are, in his, in his paintings, I'm sorry, are, their skin tone is an opaque, midnight black and it's so dark that it almost becomes a reflection of the person looking into it so i call him the mirror and then carrie may weems her photography to me is one of the first time i saw a woman a black woman use herself as a subject in a film but a, a contemplative self you know so someone who's looking at themselves and and trying to understand who they are because at this at the same time i'm trying to say that at 40 and beyond, you can still have these moments of self-discovery, you know? So here's a person who's looking at themselves. Sometimes her reflection is obscured. Sometimes it's smudgy. Sometimes it's clear or blocked or whatever. And so, um, you know, thank you for seeing that because that was my intention is to show that there are things in the way of her yeah. reflection. Yeah. Rada, thank you so much for your time. And I, I Oh, thank you, Edith. This was great. When we get to uh, you know, to travel that you, you get across here and I'll be first in line to, to to see that show as well. I would love that. Thanks for having me. I appreciate Ma it. Massive congratulations on the film and lovely for, to have a time with you. Thanks so much, Rada. Take Same care. here. All right, Stay take safe. care. Isn't she brilliant? I love her. I can't wait. Um, she's definitely, I've been making a list of people that I, I've been meeting through this, um, through doing the podcast and stuff since lockdown, that I would desperately love to meet in person. And Rada is oh, just at the top of my list because I think she's absolutely brilliant. And I'm very excited to see what she does next. And um, you can hear her on the podcast this week as well. And Ben, who works with me in the podcast, has put loads of great music in there as well. There's, there's a big chunk that I didn't leave in, uh, in this conversation because it's on the podcast. So you can hear her talk quite in depth about music in the film as well. But go and seek out the 40-year-old version. It's on Netflix now. It's fantastic. Uh, and please do go and listen to the podcast as well. Uh, I'll see you back here next time. And in the meantime, please get subscribing both to this and to the podcast if you aren't already. All right. Take care. Stay safe.